morning. Welcome to the ninth episode of AMTD Infinity Power Decast Series. Um, I would like to introduce our guest speaker today, Emma. And before we start, I would like to say a big thank you to AMTD Oku Hotel for supporting us for this big car series productions. Actually, uh, Emma and myself were just sitting in this stunning guest room that we have uh, from the hotel. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, AMTD Oku, for supporting us. Now, Emma, um, let me just do a quick introduction sure. of your stunning um, uh, experience. So Emma Tui is the founder and CEO of Long Hash Ventures. Uh, it is a leading Web 3.0 accelerator and capital fund focused on early stage crypto and blockchain projects. Long Hash Ventures manage AUM of 50 million and has invested in more than 70 Web 3.0 startups. And prior to Long Hash, Emma has worked as a management consultant with McKenzie under the digital McKenzie practice. And prior to that, she has also close to a decade of banking experience with ANZ and Macquarie, spanning across corporate and commercial and long syndications. She also has a Master of Science from uh, Singapore MIT Alliance. And prior to that, she also has a full scholarship from Nanyang Technological University. Very warm welcome for you to join us today. Um, I think one of the most discussed topic in the last Singapore FinTech Festival is about Web 3.0. And also, I think we have been hearing a lot of talks about crypto, NFTs, and the potential it has, and also I think we're looking at Bitcoin prices also at a record high. So can you share with us what has drive you to fund the Long Hash Ventures and also what are the vision that you have in this space? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, and also thank you for having this uh, video session in this uh, uh, amazing hotel. Um, so I'm Emma. Um, I founded uh, Long Hash Venture about uh, three years ago together with a, another uh, consultant from McKinsey, Shikai, who is our CEO. Um, I think when we ran went down the rabbit hole of crypto, we were really kind of inspired by the notion of Web 3.0. Um, and it's basically a more uh, open and equitable internet um, that uh, you know gives back the control of data and assets back to the user. Um, so we, over the last three years, we've uh, ran uh, six batches of uh, acceleration programs. We've uh, worked with leading protocols such as Polkadot, Filecoin. Um, we've invested in more than 70 projects across decentralized finance, NFT, um, GameFi. Um, I, I think it's been a super exciting three years, really seeing how crypto managed to cross the chasm from three years ago where there was a lot of um, skepticism around what crypto is, what Web3 is to today. I think in the recent, uh, you know, uh, Singapore FinTech Festival, even the, um, you know, um, MAS and, um, and uh, Chief FinTech Officer was talking about Metaverse, it, it feels surreal. So we're still early in this journey, but super excited that uh, we're part of it. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the things um, I think last week during the Singapore FinTech Festival, we have been really hearing very different definitions of what Web 3.0 is. And it seems like everybody has a different perception of how that is being defined. Now, I think, can you help us and also help our audience here who are tuning into the channel to really understand uh, what is the vision of Web 3.0 and how does it work? Sure, sure. Happy to provide my take. Um, and I think you're right. Different people have different definition. There's really no um, kind of commonly accepted standards. Uh, for us, I think to understand what is Web 3.0, you have to understand what's the definition of Web 1.0 and Web 2.0. So for us, Web 1.0 is where when the internet was created, right? A bunch of nerds trying to create the, the fundamental communication protocols and it's open, it's free. Um, and, and with the vision that that, you know, everyone in the world would have access to information um, and, and, and all sorts of things. Um, so that's where you had HTTP, SMTP, right? All those kind of fundamental protocols. And then Web 2.0 uh, was basically the era where you have centralized platforms emerge and the, the fan, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, right? You have all this uh, internet age, uh, internet native applications that grow into, you know, a behemoth and they're able to uh, monetize users' data and uh, have a uh, monopoly or oligopoly in, in their respective vertical. 
And uh, I think uh, the problem with Web 2.0 is people, uh, a lot of the users of the platform become kind of uh, data, they give out their data for free and not able to get any benefits out of, outside of that, right? And there's also privacy concerns and all that. So Web 3.0 is where, you know, with the emergence of cryptography and also distributed ledger, um, a lot of the techies saw another chance of bring back the notions of Web 1.0 with cryptography and distributed ledger, you're able to build this kind of open permissionless uh, applications and protocols that yep. kind of, you know, allow for a, a more equal participation of, uh, of the internet economy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th I think one of the things we also noticed from uh, investment concept and also where the forces were driving some of these changes is that uh, the clearly institutional investors also come in big time mm. into the space. And I, I think we have been hearing a lot about like Catherine Woods actually <clears throat> is a very big support uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the potential of uh, things in this area. So what do you think are driving some of these trends and uh, what do you think this trends and uh, that will go next yeah um, that's a billion dollar question yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, definitely personally a big fan of Kathy Wood of how fa forward-looking she is um, I think um, the reason why institutions are starting to look at this space more seriously is because they start to realize the huge potential this technology brings and there's various use cases and applications that are building using the same technology block and say for example bitcoin was the first uh, cryptocurrency that was created right this p2p uh, cryptocurrency and uh, and now it has emerged as a um, store of value right that uh, is dumped as the digital gold um, and um, and its market cap has reached one trillion dollars and I think a lot of the institutions has starts to not just the, um, the financial institutions yeah. but also corporates and governments right are starting to put Bitcoin um, on their balance sheet or treat Bitcoin as a legal tender mm -hmm. so I think that's a recognition of Bitcoin's property as mm -hmm. a store of value and then you look at the second largest cryptocurrency which is Ethereum so Ethereum is a decentralized uh, computing platform yep. with a smart contract and you're able to build applications on this smart contract whether it's financial applications or whether it's social applications and um, and whatever those applications are open permissionless and most importantly those applications can build on top of each other so you can imagine how powerful that is right because the the pace of innovation would be leaps and bounds faster than the traditional world um, and because of that, I think Ethereum has got a lot of mainstream adoption over sure. the last uh, two years. And I think institutions are looking at Ethereum as a very interesting, fast-growing in, uh, technology company. Right? So there's different nar narratives for, for, for Bitcoin and Ethereum. And after uh, Ethereum, you also have 5,000 different cryptocurrencies, right? Like one, um, one project we're super uh, heavily invested in and also um, passionate about it's called Polkadot right so Polkadot says they want to build a better version um, kind of like uh, Ethereum is Bitcoin 2.0 and they are uh, kind of uh, uh, blockchain 3.0 and they want to uh, bring a, a, a kind of superior technology framework to do uh, to fulfill the vision of smart contract platforms so um, I think because of all these different properties um, into, uh, and also the fast adoption by retail by the grassroots uh, kind of forced institutions to take a hard look at this space and mm -hmm. they feel like they can't really miss given the, the rapid growth of this space yeah yeah I think in the last uh, week we also saw Gavin Wood sharing uh, what is driving him to create a better product and I think that passion we can really sense it uh, from from I think as an innovator or as a, as a, as a business founder that uh, you know a lot of those things are driving the changes now I think I would like to come back to uh, uh, one of the questions that I think has been also uh, being raised a lot uh, mm -hmm. recently uh, is around um, when we compare the traditional which is the current world we're working uh, or living in a lot of things is on a centralized model where I think when things goes wrong we can actually resort to someone or speak to someone but I think how does that is going to work in a DeFi world when everything is working fine uh, if you know it's, 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 it's open it's connected but if things just go wrong who do we talk to? Yeah, <laughs> I, 
I think those are very valid questions that everyone within the crypto community are asking themselves about, right? So the early adopters of crypto are uh, nerds, techies, right? Who a lot of them are programmers, so they can read the code, audit the code. So there's this saying in crypto community, code is law. So whatever is programmed is the law. So if there's a, a loophole, if it's been hacked, then it's, uh, you know, it, nobody's kind of responsible for that, right? So it's a little bit unlimited extreme and it hard for a retail to swallow um, but that shows how early we are in this journey so now you also have the emergence of uh, uh, um, centralized uh, CBDCs right you have uh, also one trend we're seeing is a lot of the crypto exchanges wallets yep. are getting um, uh, increasing regulatory oversight um, so I think there will be a this space will move towards more coexistence of decentralized infrastructure as backend and kind of some sort of centralized um, front end. So we call it CD5, mm -hmm. specifically within the financial industry. Right. Because crypto um, as backend mm -hmm. is scalable, permissionless, yep. and uh, you, you can, it's leaps and bounds better than today's financial infrastructure yep. Yep. such as SWIFT. Mm. Um, but on the front end, you probably still need to abstract away a lot of the, 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 the loopholes, the uh, complexities, also satisfy um, the regulatory oversight and all that, and really make it usable for the mass retail out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think um, also another relevant question, more from a retail perspective I think for some of them I think crypto has been um, you know frequently searched word on the internet and NFTs and uh, you know the potentials when these two subjects connect together and we have seen some records you know transactions um, what do you suggest for some of the retail investors who are trying to get into this space um, what kind of advice would you give to them um, that's a very good question I think if you're Purely from an investing perspective, I think do your research is very important. Yeah. Uh, I know there's a lot of uh, noise out there when the market is hot, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, so really look at, uh, do as much as uh, research as possible. Look at who are the investors that are backing the projects. Mm -hmm. Check out what's the use case of the um, uh, project. Uh, third thing is try out the product of this project. Mm -hmm. And you'll be surprised there's uh, uh, for those Web3 native uh, projects Projects, right the early users will be rewarded in most cases with uh, you know either token job or something I'm not saying they will have to happen mm -hmm. but just like when grab and um, you know was was trying to acquire uh, drivers or users they were giving out a lot of rewards and all that right and yeah. web3 companies are doing that trying to you know reward the early community so I would encourage people to try out the product to get a sense of that right mm. um, but also lastly um, you know get the basics right because if you're gonna go out there venture into this fast rapidly evolving space right you need to understand some of the basic concepts so rate Bitcoin white paper uh, understand what's private key public key um, understand the risk of using different uh, kind of um, uh, you know different wallets should you use cold storage hot storage so I think there are some basics people need to get through before yeah, they yeah. jump into the, the, the space right and become an investor 